We'll start in a second. We're live. Yeah, we're live. Okay. Hi, I'm James McGuire, editor of Datamation, and our topic today is DevOps uh, challenges and solutions. Let's talk about that. We've got four DevOps thought leaders, including Andy Mann, VP of Strategic Solutions at CA Technologies. Andy, how are you today? Uh, great, James. Thank you. And I see that the three of you are in the same room because you're at this, in the same conference, right? Also, uh, Laurie McVitie, a senior product manager mm -hmm. of F5 Networks, and uh, JP Morgenthal with uh, Proficient. How are you guys doing? Good. Hi, James. Well, what, is the, what is the conference you're all at? It's Glucon, and yesterday was Camp DevOps. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, also with us is Damon Edwards, the co-founder of uh, DTO Solutions. Hello to you, Damon. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, DevOps, say you're a, a theoretical developer or operational person and you want to get on board with DevOps. How do you justify that to your company? I mean, how do you, how do you let them know it can really improve the process? How, how do you talk about that? Uh, Andy, why don't you start us off with that? Yeah, sure, man. That's actually something I presented on yesterday at Camp DevOps with the idea ah, of well, there, getting, there you go. getting yeah. down support for a DevOps initiative. You know, especially in larger businesses, which is where mostly I work, uh, it's it's difficult for an individual at an operations or, or development level to get that sort of full organization cultural change and push it up. You've got to get that top line support. So I talked a little bit about uh, understanding your management's goals. Uh, you know, what is your mission? What's your CIO's mission? What's the company goals? What are the corporate goals? And finding ways to align that. Looking for the sort of MBOs, the KPIs that your boss is looking for. Uh, you know, what does the organization want to achieve in terms of outcomes? Is it all about cost saving? Is it about getting applications out faster? Is it about being able to do new things in, that you couldn't do before? Uh, maybe, you know, developing for mobile. Find the goals that are going to get you there. Um, and don't try and bite it off all at once. You know, find the individual problems that are stopping you getting to where you need to be and solve those problems even one at a time. Maybe taking a pace layered approach, you know, a different approach to your systems of innovation versus systems of differentiation or systems of record. Um, and deal with things like risk. You know, understand what your organization's tolerance for risk is and work with that create risk mitigation strategy so that you're not throwing all your eggs in one basket and you're not setting yourself up to fail. I mean, especially in a large company, change happens diffi is difficult and happens slowly. So, you know, work within those boundaries. You know, there's some of the ideas that I talked about yesterday. Is there, do you think there's a lot of pushback when people try to convince their companies to get on board with that? People go, oh, we, we've heard about it, we're not interested. And that's actually interesting. The research that we've done, and we've done a bunch of research um, on this topic, and it seems like there's a, a significant appetite to adopt DevOps at a manager and executive level. They don't necessarily know what it is, uh, but <laughs> right. they feel that they'd like to adopt. You know, they're hearing it. They're getting management by magazine. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of pushback. I mean, the research we did, it was only about 13% of organizations were uh, undecided or no on their desire to move forward with the DevOps strategy. So I think the 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 senior executives are starting to hear it more and more. They're starting to see the results are real. So I don't think I don't see a lot of pushback still. Laurie, what's your sense if, if uh, someone wants to justify DevOps to their company? Is there a specific strategy you might, you might recommend? Yeah, I think you know a lot of what Andy said makes sense. You have to identify the places that maybe automating tasks is going to either prove out you know cost savings or is going to improve the process so that you're getting your application to production faster. You have to identify which what's holding you back. Why can't you do that now and where can you find those savings and attack it from you know that specific domain rather than just trying to do the whole thing. You can't do it all at once. You have to find what's going to prove out the best value as your starting point to show yes, this can improve and align us with the business. It can make us more agile, efficient, all of the buzzwords you get in there. Um, and then actually do it. But you, you have to look at the processes first and say, what's really holding us back and how can DevOps help with that? And then try and prove that out somehow using you know, some sort of either you know, model or just saying, hey, you know, this is where we think it can go. You know, let us try. Damon, is that a square with your experience? I mean, do you, first of all, do you hear much about pushback from management, or is it pretty well accepted? And, and how do people justify DevOps for their companies? Well, I, th I think it depends how you approach it, right? I mean, if you approach it as DevOps, and you say, you know, DevOps is going to save us, or DevOps is going to be great for us, you'll hear um, people ask, well, you know, 
prove to me DevOps is the right thing for us. And, and that to me proves that, or to all that is an indicator that the message hasn't really been communicated properly to the people who need to make these decisions. Uh, because really all we're saying with DevOps is that, you know, it's a it's an umbrella for a, a topic of, or a field of problems. It's an umbrella, umbrella for a area of discussion around solutions about essentially, you know, time to market quality and improving effectiveness of your organization. And there's not a company on the planet that would not agree with that as something that we need to do. Yes, time to market is more is is, is important to us. Quality is important to us. Improving improving effectiveness is important to us. So, you know, when it's explained that way, when you go to the business and say, "Look, you know, uh, we are a software-driven business. Every business now is pretty much a software-driven business, right? This is our factory floor. This is how we make our money. Even if we sell a physical product, the software component of what we do is going to be essential for time to market, quality, and uh, the effectiveness of our organization. So how about we um, you know, get on board with this movement where people are talking about doing just that? And how they're doing it is you know, they're breaking down how they used to do things and rethinking from the ground up, you know, how do we organize our organization, how do we organize our processes, and then how do we find all the right tools that are going to make that, make that work. So I think if you have trouble selling DevOps, first of all, stop trying to sell DevOps. Uh, and secondly, realize that what you're selling is improve time to market, improve quality, and improve or, you know, or organizational effectiveness. I haven't met a company yet that, that's, that, at least in the past few years, that has really cared about cost, per se. Um, no one says, you know, I need to spend less on my IT. Um, at least no, no company that's actually thriving or, or has a chance of thriving. Instead, they're saying, I need more effectiveness. I need to do more things. So I don't want to spend a lot more money, but of this X millions of dollars that I have to spend today, or billions of dollars I have to spend today, I want 2, 3x amount of innovation and speed out of this uh, of this organization. So don't worry about that we're going to save money because no one's really paying attention to that. It's time to market, quality, and you know, effectiveness, right? How much how much oomph can we get for our dollar instead of mucking around in stuff that's uh, not getting us anywhere? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. You know, the, the research that we did actually, the, you talk about the, no one wants to, to get out of bed to cut money out of their budget. The research we did out of about 10 different items, cost reduction was the least important. I think about yeah. 16% of, of, and this was managers and IT execs, about 16% listed ability to reduce cost as a key yeah. driver. You know, Andy, I'd, I'd go one better. I'd say they put that on there because they thought they were supposed to. <laughs> yeah, you're I mean, right. it's those things like you can't say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a responsible executive. I want to spend less money. Because, I mean, I see this all the time in meetings. It's like, hey, what's your problems, guys? And talking to CIOs, and it's like time to market and quality. Those were one and two, right? And usually, usually actually, Tight, tightly coupled, they don't really, they don't really see often how they are. But it's always time to market and quality. And then it's like as you're walking out the door, oh yeah, yeah. Also, can we, you know, spend less money? <laughs> you know, it's like I think clicks in their head like they were trained, like that's just something they're supposed to say. But in terms of what they want, what actually gets them out of bed in the morning, um, saving money is just not, you know, you know, no great company was started by an accountant, right? That's totally unfair to accountants. But <laughs> you know, you know. Pinching, uh, you know, pinching, um, pinching pennies isn't going to get anybody where they where they want to go. Doesn't mean they want to spend frivolously, but you know, they know they need to spend to get somewhere. Well, okay. So say that say a, a company has DevOps up and running. They're actually using the process on a regular basis. You know, w what's a common obstacle the companies run into, and most importantly, how, how do companies get around that? Uh, JP, what do you see out there in terms of a, a possible problem with the process? The uh, well, you, uh, the first one is that uh, everyone's trying to make DevOps one size fits all, and we that's come up a lot uh, yesterday in discussion, and also with the uh, the 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 WSJ piece uh, by Rachel uh, Shannon Solomon. You know, uh, there's this belief that there's a one size fits all DevOps, and yesterday in my talk, I, I represented that there's most likely going to be a startup DevOps approach, a mid-sized company DevOps approach, and an enterprise DevOps approach, because each one has a different set of attributes with regard to what their function is with regard to the business and what's expected of them. In a startup, your engineering team is your bread and butter. I mean, that's they are making the product. They are, you know, they're birthing the baby. And then on the enterprise side, this is the engine that runs the company. It's supposed to be very uh, steady state. Supposed to be very predictable. Um, you want your operations people to be meticulous. You want them to not introduce a lot of risk and a lot of change. Um, and so, to approach these two universes identically uh, is is one of the fundamental flaws uh, that we see today with regard to DevOps. But when we but the beauty of it is that if we treat DevOps as an approach to gaining agility, 
and then looking at how each individual organization can absorb and what they can absorb um, with regard to getting to that end goal. Then we, uh, so if we're approaching the enterprise, the things we need to accept is that they're siloed for a reason. They gain uh, efficiencies and focus through silos. The group that fo you know that focuses on uh, operating and mainframe and maintaining the mainframe, and the ones that manage and storage and servers, and the ones that deploy the application infrastructure, they have their focus and they contribute to the overall mission. And the the trick is not to come in uh, and, and to to create the, a cultural revolution and try to get everybody there in that organization to sing kumbaya and sit at the same, ta same table. It doesn't work across a 2,000, 3,000 person IT shop that's spread across multiple contents. But that uh, there are aspects of what we've learned about how to drive agility and how to create a focal point that everybody can contribute to that allows them the same benefits at the, at the, at the end um, which is really what we want to achieve from DevOps. I, I, I talk a little bit about military analogy when one thing, some of the stuff I learned when working with the DOD, which is that we can, you know, if you look at armies, they're, they're really independent groups of regiments and they are operated by a overall overarching mission set by the, the leading commanding officer uh, and then it, each regiment has its own commanding officer that manages inside where the general rules don't apply or, or, or context relative to being on the ground. The same thing applies in an enterprise. And if we, you know, the thing that's missing there, and I think the thing that'll come out through DevOps, is that many organizations don't have a clear mission from the executive officers, the CEO, the CIO, the COO, as to what it is we're doing this year for business, what it is we're involved in, and what we need to achieve. And if you had three of those in front of you, paste it on your wall every day. I guarantee you, I don't care if you're the sysop, the sysadmin, a Java developer, you all know what, you, what your goals are. And that's not there. Can I actually jump in there real quick? Uh, so I agree with a lot of most of what most of what JP just said, except for one thing: that this idea that enterprises are siloed for a good reason, uh, they're siloed because of bad management decisions. It's a decision that was made at at a point in time that seemed like the right thing, but it's not the right. I mean, it's it's using a historical example. Let's look at you know like GM versus Toyota, right? I mean, that was the same excuse that people used in sort of the anti-lean movement when, you know, Toyota was coming and cleaning people's clocks was this notion that, oh, you know, we're, we, we run this way for good reason and we get these efficiencies from doing it this way and we get all these things that I think if you actually go and, and walk through their organization, they aren't getting the efficiencies, they aren't getting the control, they aren't getting the stability. I mean, they've got 30, 40 years of history of showing that this is not working. They only move this the pace they're going because things are broken, because they're siloed, because of the handoffs they force things to go through, because they've built these organizational structures that basically, you know, the customer cares about a service. They care about whether it's a product being delivered to them or a web service that they're accessing. That's what they see. They, if you look inside a, a you know large siloed enterprise, it looks nothing like that. You've got this dev thing over here, this ops thing over here, this QA thing over here, this security folks, quality assurance, customer service. None of that makes sense to the customer because we, we're not aligning ourselves to actually deliver deliver, deliver value to the customer. They're aligning themselves to 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 uh, to fight management battles. They're aligning themselves to sort of you know have political uh, you know gain. They're basically you know they're working. They spend a lot of time working for. Um, the organization and the structure not working for for the customer, and I think that's fundamentally something that enterprises, the ones that are, I think are successfully transforming themselves, are the ones that have to that have faced the facts that this is a management problem. This is a problem that was created by how they designed and drew their world and incentivized their troops, and that you know that that that's where the fault lies, and that's a thing that has to be um, you know directly uh, addressed if they're ever going to succeed. Otherwise. This idea that, oh, you know, we're going to just kind of glom on some tools or we're going to take the release management people and call them DevOps people and have them fix these problems without fundamentally fixing um, the management thinking that drew their world in that way, um, things aren't going to get any different. So that's um, a, that, that, oh, oh, I'm glad you're not, you're not promoting that, you know, DevOps is a silver bullet. It's not. And you... You've definitely. You've I mean, DevOps it. doesn't really. There is no such thing as. It's not like oh, there's no methodology to it. There's no, you know, DevOps is a collection of ideas. And so it's saying that the principles behind what people want out of DevOps, you know, work in small batches, limit the number of handoffs, um, you know, you know, you know, have, you know, test early and often. Uh, uh, you know, there's a long kind of laundry list of things there. Those principles are 
exist for anybody, but how you implement them, there's you know there's 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 any number of ways to go to go uh, to go about it. But but promoting the fact, but but attempting to drive something new like this, or mm -hmm. new concepts with the, with a uh, a key component of it being that we need some sort of, uh, and I'll call it cultural revolution, to, akin to you know tearing down the silos, right? That's mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. significant. And my only my only thought on that is that it's we know what we're dealing with in enterprises, and uh, and we need to take a, a pragmatic approach in order to get them. The advantages uh, of agility, and I think that one, you know, it's like the auto industry that we, the changes we saw in the auto industry. Once lean was adopted, and we saw successes from lean, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the organization was ready to take that and embrace it further and implement Six Sigma. But to go in and say we got to tear down the silos in order to succeed, I think is a uh, a significant hurdle which will lead to failure. It's, it's a disaster. You can't you can't ask them to do that. You're you're telling them you know basically destroy the tower in which you live, and and the management is not going to go for that. One of the things that DevOps should do, if you're trying to limit those handoffs between the dev guys and the operations, and then down to network and security too. If you look through the rest of the enterprise, if you're trying to limit the handoffs and the difficulties that go on, as you're basically passing that app to the next silo is DevOps should build that bridge and make those use the interfaces between them and the automation to make it easier for them to start basically building such a big bridge between them that they just become one giant silo and one bigger silo until finally all of you know the data center is basically one big silo and under one big you know happy you know family but you can't just say you got to start by getting rid of everything that you have now you know, this should be a way to well, build. I mean, actually, wait, hang on, time out. I, I, I never said that. I said you need to. The way you just said, you said actually, Lori, actually was just what I was talking about. You actually just described a process to, 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 to break down silos. Silos doesn't mean no, no silos doesn't mean no groups, right? It's the idea that you have this handoff where you have groups that don't have that aren't that don't have an aligned point of view and some piece of work that I have to work on it. And then suddenly, I got to hand it over to Andy, who has a different boss, a different set of of of, uh, of of goals, his own way of being measured. Doesn't have the same, you know, the same context that, that I have. He has to then start taking this thing, re-engineering it, figure out what's going on. And then, oh, lo and behold, the last minute, right before he hands it off to Lori, the ops person, JP, the security guy, shows up and says, "Wait a minute, I need to now actually go through here and and scan this thing and see if this is this is this is correct or not." Well, guess what? Andy's the QA guy. He's already one step removed from me, who's a developer who was who was writing this thing. I've already been retasked to another capital project because my time is money. I'm a, you know I'm the I'm the uh, I'm the I'm the crucial developer. And then at the end of the day, finally, when you know if JP signs off, then Lori gets it and hand, hands off and says, okay, I'm the ops person. Now I got to figure out what the heck to do with this thing, make this thing run. I mean that's silos, right? Now how that would normally work in a sort of non-siloed way is to say, hey, well. First of all, let's try to build a cross-functional team as much as possible. Let's try to get myself, Andy, um, and Lori uh, um, on the same team. Maybe we can't. Maybe Lori's the infrastructure person. We can't. She can't be there all the time. Uh, JP's a security guy. There's only five of him, and there's 500 developers. Andy's, you know, QA. He's hopelessly outnumbered by developers as well. So maybe we'll have Lori, JP, and Andy build self-service interfaces, build tools that, um, as a developer. I, in my group, I may have, have, have a representative of the ops team, representative of the, Q, the QA team. I can now, um, uh, you know, do all the work I need to do to get this thing to production myself using the, J, using the security scanning tools and standards that came from JP, using the testing tools and standards that came from Andy, yet I write and add my own tests. Uh, maybe Andy maintains a small group of his own that does some sort of kind of uh, you know specialized uh, you know testing, and then Lori provides me with the self-service interfaces to order up whatever server images or things that I that I need. And that way, I've still got four groups, probably four different four different parts of the world, four different you know that look were people that were in the old silos, but I've now created a style of working to which. Um, you know, there are no more silos to where, you know, information flows through those artifact flows, not from having to do those those handoffs. So that, that's more what I'm talking about. I think if you go in and say, hey, wipe your org chart clean and start from there, that's definitely not what I'm, what what I'm trying you, to say. Sorry for, for that, that long-winded example, but I just want to be clear that you know, I, when you're attacking I, silos, it's, it's the siloed thinking, the siloed culture. Right. I thought it was important to raise as a factor because it, people could assume that that was what you, is implied, and others have implied yeah. that this is all about a, a cultural revolution. This is all about a change in the right. way 
do IT instead, uh, and reading into that as we have to tear down the walls and rebuild it from scratch versus we need to rethink, you know, how we're approaching the problem domain and then look to how we can, you know, fix certain things that we know are hurdles or in, 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 that impair our, abil our ability to have agility and then drive and fix those. And, and that's, you know, that's the pragmatic approach here. Just, just to be clear, I mean, I go ask someone ask, you know, can this be done without the cultural shift? There seems to be some people saying yes or no. I want to be clear on this. Because, I, I mean, I've known a lot of developers. I've known a lot of operational people. And they tend to be very different in the way they approach their job. And obviously their job is very different. So, you know, DevOps says there's a cultural shift necessary. Can DevOps be fully leveraged without the cultural shift of making these people work far closer than they ever have worked? A Andy, your sense of that? I, look, I don't think you can do this without the cultural change. Um, you got, and the cultural change has to be driven in a lot of ways from above because what you're talking about with operations and developers and QA and other people having different goal sets, um, that comes from management. And you know, to Damon's point, that's that's a structural deficiency in getting teams to work together is when you have them having conflicting goals. So you've got to change that. If you just try and do it with you know technology. Um, if you just tried to do it within one or two groups, then I think you're, you're going to fail. You're going to end up running into passive non-compliance. You're going to end up uh, just moving the bottleneck. That's one of the things I see in, in, in larger organizations especially. Uh, if, only, if you only change within dev, for example, or you only change within ops, or even both of those, then maybe you're just shifting the bottleneck into QA. You're shifting the bottleneck into uh, you know, HR, into training, into front office support. Uh, shifting the bottleneck doesn't help. So you've got to change the culture and the way everyone's looking at delivering new functionality. And yeah. you've got to have everyone on board to deliver faster, to have seamless handoffs, to automate more, to get you know, hands off a little bit more, to let people do all their job. And otherwise, yeah, you're going to get this sort of passive non-compliance where people sort of nod their head in the team meeting and then go back to their desk and do exactly what they've been doing before. Yeah. And yeah, that's and, a I think it's really important to point out too that you know culture is one of these greatly misunderstood terms, probably as much as even DevOps is. And so you know, I, we talk about culture, people think it's like you know the HR folks with their posters on the wall and they want you to come to the company picnic and you know or you know the happy hour or wear the hoodie. You know, they they don't really understand. I mean, that's probably not a lot of hoodies in corporate America, but you get my you get my you get my point. And I think really all we're saying by you have to ch attack the culture to change the culture. Not attack the culture is a bad word. You have to change the culture. It's really just saying what to change how people work. What to change how you know how they how they do their day to day work and also how they see their role in the organization. As JP said, what their mission you know what their what their what their goal is. So you know a lot of that really breaks down to um, you know. Uh, well, yeah, it's supposed to do things. See, <laughs> they have to understand they need to work differently, right? So, for example, um, in a large enterprise, you have folks that believe they believe they're writing software. They believe, but and then the ops folks believe they have to operate software. The reality is, you're writing services, you're creating services. So, the idea that we're going to wait to test it later, that we're going to wait to put the automation in later, that we're going to wait to try it out on on a production like uh, configuration or platform till later. Um, is is just ludicrous, right? I mean, it's just, just not common sense. If, but if you come to yourself, hey, we're, we're service developers, so therefore, of course, I'm going to write the deployment scripts and the automation tests, and of course, I'm going to do everything just like I would be deploying my my service um, in my dev environments because by the time it gets to... I'm sorry, Lori, to make you, make you the ops person in all these uh, examples, but by the time it gets to Lori... It's just as the features are the, the running, the automation, the tests, the tests, the monitoring is just as important to the application as uh, the, the the functional uh, code is. So therefore, um, I need to be writing that and testing that and working with that in a standard sort of platform, standard tooling all the way through, um, you know, my uh, my life cycle. And oh, my life cycle needs to be a lot shorter because I want to have that instant fast feedback. So you know, when you start to think of it that way, is what's the ideal way for my organization to work to achieve our goal? Then you know the culture thing sorts itself out because that's really what we're talking about. But if you don't change how people work, if you think you're going to fix this by you know doing a reorg, which is probably the most demoralizing things we see, if people just you know, oh great, here comes DevOps, here comes another another reorg, um, or hey, I'm just going to have the release management people you know brand themselves DevOps and you know whitewash all their tools uh, uh, you know with with the DevOps name on it, um, you really aren't going to get anywhere. It's just not it's just not going to happen. It's just like in the Agile Revolution. Uh, excuse me, they are, or Agile is a good example, Oracle, they're going back to lean and manufacturing. Those that just did the, 
hey, we're going to use the lean tools. We're going to, you know, lean tools. We're going to call things with lean names. They never got the benefit. Well, I think there's a there's an issue there with um, the idea of cultural change being someone else's responsibility. You know, when you talk about changing the culture of the organization, it's like you're waiting for that to happen elsewhere. And I think it's important, you know, what you were saying, uh, to get the attitudinal change at the individual level. Individuals have to change the way they think and the way they operate. If you right. just say, oh, it's a cultural change, then you can fall into that trap of, of thinking, it, yeah, it's HR's job to do that or it's the CIO's job to do that. Whereas yeah, right. DevOps, uh, it seems to me that the cultural change has to be personal. It has to be a change in attitudes and how you work with people. Yeah, managers okay. love talking about culture, but nobody ever actually, nobody in an organization, none of the line folks give a crap about culture. It's like, hey, I, I, I'm, I, I show up, I do my job, and I go home. Hopefully it's an enjoyable, hopefully it's an enjoyable and rewarding experience and I get paid a lot of money for it. But I don't want to hear about your, you know, culture mantra. Like that's, you know, yeah, it that's, can't be that's your problem. And so I, I break it down actually into, into three specific things, right? Accountability, incentive, and directives. Those are the three things that need to come down from, uh, you know, as a package to the IT environment, and that will drive how they behave. And in much way, you know, any of these, uh, dri you know, elsewhere in the organization, it's how sales is driven, it's how marketing is driven, it's how production is driven. It's used everywhere else in the organ enterprise except for IT. They are missing those three essential elements. Right. Can I, can I, can I, oh, go, go, go ahead, Lori, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Part of the, the cultural problem, too, is that we're talking, we call it DevOps. And we focus specifically on, on operations or dev. But the reason that we have things like software-defined networking right now and all of these new things on the network side is because they recognize that they're quickly becoming the bottleneck in, in this whole delivery process for the application. So they have to do something. And it's all about the same thing. It's about automating, it's about changing how you deploy, how you test, how you actually manage the network when it's scaling out and you're trying to get it to market. By calling it DevOps, these people are scared and they are resisting hard because they hear dev, well that's development and I have to write code and it's ops. Well that's somebody else's problem. Keep that away from me. I'm just going to keep doing it the way I am. And they can't because otherwise they will be, you know, that roadblock that stops those apps going any further when the business needs to get it out. So, you know, by by kind of focusing on the, the dev and the ops aspects and getting too detailed about tools and methodologies from development, we're not going to allow that cultural change to happen across IT. And it needs to happen all the way across IT, not just in ops and dev. It's got to go all the way to the end. Speaking of tools, if, if a company is going to get the most from DevOps, do they actually need a, a big software tool? Do you, do you go out and buy a software tool, or is it a question of an internal process? Can you get the most uh, with an internal process? Lower your sense you need a tool or not for DevOps? <laughs> I, I want to get you in trouble here. Well, I mean, part of DevOps is, is the automation is about optimizing the process to make it go faster. Right. And so if you can do that without a tool, Good luck, but you know, sure, go ahead. It's not so much about the tool as it is about optimizing the processes and figuring out what's working, what's not, and how to get that moving faster. You don't necessarily need a new or better tool. Now, will that make that process faster or better? Yes, absolutely. I think that you know, tools are, are something that we're going to use in order to make that happen. Um, and so they're going to be an important part of this whole cultural change and the, the shift in how we work, but uh, you know, are they strictly necessary? No, I, I don't think so. No, I, I, I would I would add to that that the uh, perspective of tools has been a significant misunderstood area, significantly misunderstood area of DevOps, and it's because of the rise in the in the open source community tooling that has grown up around you know the modern cloud computing era. So things were missing in order to add automation and add self service so provisioning auto scale, things like that. And so the vacuum was filled by open source communities and they became um, you know, the clear in, in leaders in, into this movement. But, by, but you know, and for a startup who's building and you know, innovating in this area, it's very easy for people to say, oh look, this startup is doing this process and they're being really successful. But let's remember that they're starting Greenfield, they're building something completely new, they're innovating, and they're looking for the lowest cost path to getting there. Now you take an enterprise who's already invested in tools like 
CA and IBM and BMC and HP, and they have a significant arsenals of these tools. These tools are fine for implementing and gaining agility through a, you know, a DevOps change if you want to be a, apply them to that function. And these companies are helping their, biz, you know, biz, their customers to apply their tool sets in this way, and that change is coming. But, you, but many of these tools already exist in the organization. It's just how they're organized. And I think Andy would agree with that. Andy's done a great job of helping CA take what they already own and bundle it so that it supports this particular goal um, with a consolidated and integrated tool set. So there's some work that can be done there, but do you need to go out and buy or, or download all these different tools and be retrained on things like Vagrant and Chef and, and Jenkins and Git? Not if you have their tool set and you have an enterprise license to it already. It's a matter of learning how to use it. And the danger that befalls enterprises today is as the, develop, the groundswell, the, the grassroots movement moves forward with DevOps, um, you, you see individuals going out there and introducing without permission of executives and without a, a, a definite decision to go in a particular direction, Vagrant, Chef, Jenkins, and you end up with all this a silo, all these different new tool silos, and it's, and by the way, software is code, right? Everything's becoming software, so who's managing the new 35,000 lines of code that actually runs the other 200,000 lines of code now? It's like Shadow DevOps. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so, I mean, what you're describing also is, you know, a, a you're right. If they don't change their silo of thinking, they end up with a new silo. But I think a lot of times they go and do that because the old tools were created with an old way of thinking, right? And I think that's that's the, the it doesn't the, it's not the tool. It's how people want to work. And this is why I think the open source tools caught on because it wasn't that. Um, it wasn't that the tools were free. I think there's plenty of companies that will spend will spend will spend money on that. Sure, the five person startup doesn't care, but the cost of a tool to a you know to a bank, to an insurance company, to to any of these, any of these folks, folks we work with a lot, um, they don't care, right? It's it, it's it, it's truly insignificant, even if it's you know even if it's a it's a multi million dollar spend. The problem is it's how people want to work, and when they see these new tools when they see something like a, a vagrant. Right, and they under and they get the idea that as a developer, wow, I now have a a a, a manifest driven way to say, boom, I've got my full you know production environment, uh, on, well, not, you know, or production style environment on five boxes, bang, it's it's right there. The VMs come up, mm -hmm. and I go to hand it hand it off to 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 my ops uh, team. The ops team runs, you know, they do a Git pull, they run Vagrant up, right? So from source. It loads Vagrant up. It either works or it doesn't, and it goes through all the steps. They see everything working right there. Like the cloud comes to life. I mean, I've seen many people say, "Wow, I actually get the cloud now after I've used after I've used Vagrant." Do they go and use Vagrant in production? Maybe not. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Maybe they you know they probably don't use product, Vagrant production. But that style of working, it it becomes addictive to say, "Hey, this is a source driven, um, um, you know, kind of small batch, fast feedback." Everything sort of kind of you know service oriented way of uh, of, 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 of writing um, you know and, and developing and, and managing my services and allows us to all look in repositories and collaborate around that code. That's what people I think really wanted. That's what they really you know that's what the open source tools uh, provided them because it was a lot of them were written by practitioners saying, "Geez, there's got to be a better way to do this." And I think they really got out ahead of the game. And that idea of small elemental tools. Um, doesn't really play well with the large uh, vendors' business model. Sorry, Andy. It's just you know it's kind of things where you know you know you want to go in and sell millions of dollars of software, you know, and to do that you've got to go wide and you've got to go deep. And you know I think there's a strong argument there to be made to be made for that. But you know that 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 doesn't sort of uh, you know lend itself as well to that to to that uh, you know tool chain style smaller way of working. So I think there's a gap there between you know what. Hap transpired in the open source community, and you know the the traditional vendors, um, you know, catching uh, catching up. And and is it, is a tool needed uh, for for DevOps? Oh um, no, it, it's it's how oh, you're working. David, I'm sorry, it's how working. It, Doesn't it me? Oh sorry. I and Andy, is that, what's your sense of whether or not a tool would be needed to, to leverage DevOps? Look, I think it, it depends significantly on the size of the organization, and I think what Damon's saying is right to a large degree. You know, the, the historical legacy tools were not built for this mode of working. Um, a lot of them were built around the classic ITIL processes right. and being able to shut down certain capabilities, you know, change approval boards and these sorts of things. Um, so you, uh, some of those old tools are not necessarily going to work as well. Um, I think you do need some tooling, though, especially in a larger enterprise. Just the sheer scale and complexity 
especially around the automation spaces. You know, as Laurie was saying before, um, and and you know, I'd, I'd certainly say that there there are even legacy tools. You know, and I and I don't like that word, but I know it's common. Um, traditional tools, shall we say, um, that work really well in this environment. I know customers of mine using things like IT process automation tool sets, and these have been around for a decade or more. Um, to be able to automate the, the process of moving information, moving data, moving code, be able to automate things like privileged user management, password management, um, being able to automate the ability to do uh, testing in virtual environments rather than sort of testing in live environments. Um, you know, there's a lot of this stuff which it's already a solved problem. And you know, with deference to some of the open source community who are doing some great work and creating really useful tool sets, they're also in some pockets uh, doing so out of ignorance of the solved problem. They're resolving the problem in maybe a new way, but often an inferior way. Uh, where you know, uh, certainly there's open source tool set sets which are really good for this new mode of delivering better quality applications. But you know, with organisations like JP said that have already got an EOA for a process automation tool, they've got people who are already trained in it. It's already connected to multiple parts of the organisation. Why wouldn't you start there? And start to and, and again instead of creating a new silo of a new automation tool and another new automation tool, you know why wouldn't you use what you've already got? Doesn't say you're not going to get new stuff as well. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're not going to you, that you have to get everything new. But you know find what you've already got and make incremental benefit. And I think that's where some of the existing implementations of tool sets are going to already help. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a lot of good stuff. I, I'd like to give the, each of the four of you just a chance to talk about what you think is most important. I mean, I have another question about choosing a, a tool, but I think it might not be as relevant as just what you think is most important, either where are we going in the future, what should companies be most aware of, um, what, what most needs to be said about DevOps. Um, JP, that's a horribly open-ended question, but I would throw it at you nonetheless. Well, you know, all right, so for me, the, this is part of uh, the two other key initiatives that should be going on in, in, in the enterprise today. One is, uh, IT modernization. I really believe many of these organizations really haven't had the time due to, again, where they spend their hours in their day, where their budget is allocated. And, mm -hmm. and we, there are uh, statistics that show, you know, where does ops spend their time? Firefighting. Uh, they spend 60% of their time just communicating, trying to figure out uh, what's going to be deployed, when it's going to be deployed, what went wrong in a, in a, in a current deployment. So it, it, their, their time is so limited to do to focus on, A, getting rid of the backlog of work, and then participating in the innovation uh, with the other parts of the business. And that, you know, we want, we, that's really what we want to achieve is, is first to get to a point where we're, we've reached some fraction of time available to that initiative, and then using IT's capabilities to help drive the business engine. Mm -hmm. And... So IT modernization is critical in order to enable that. You know, it's, uh, and, and, it, and it incurs everything from looking at you know, what systems are running today, what is the percentage of use, uh, how much overhead do they bring onto the business, what would it take to replatform them, them in the cloud. Uh, you know, there are still businesses that, that have no compliance requirements that still run their own email servers. In this day and age, that's a ridiculous use of IT spend. Um, it, there is just no reason that any company should own their own email service at this day and age. It's just it, it, the cost benefit to putting it in the cloud is so you know well established that every CEO who doesn't have a compliance requirement should be moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, secondarily, it's delivery of IT as a service. Damon hit upon some of these points. It's definitely a, a big part of what I talk about is using the service as a metaphor for the mission. Uh, in the enterprise, and DevOps is a is a feed into the IT as a service initiatives, and IT as a service isn't just a change in IT, but I'll just I described it yesterday as, or I used this this analogy, it's moving from becoming the slumlord to becoming the concierge. So you know right. we have been delivering functionality to the business for years, but we haven't been delivering services because services entails a whole lot of other. Uh, an ecosystem that comes with that. How is it being supported? How is it being governed? How is it being uh, advertised to the end users? How is it being you know, uh, documented? It's a package. And when we, and, and we, in part of DevOps is helping to encapsulate and deliver that package, but other parts are also training. Um, it, it's testing. 
it's inclu inclusion of the business into the stage and end user acceptance testing. It's understanding the pipeline. What's coming at me? If, um, DevOps, big aspect of this is dev test. Well, that's great. I have a, I've convinced the business to give me an environment that looks like production that, that we can do dev test on. It's sized X. Now, we can grow it if we see that much coming at us that we decide as a business it makes sense to grow this so we can do 14 more projects this year. But if you don't tell me it's coming and all of you attack me at once asking for resources, guess what? Ain't going to happen. So then what happens? Oh, people say, well, Amazon's available, Google's available. That's great. That's a business decision. And I feel like that's where IT, shadow IT comes in and takes that opportunity for the business to make that decision away from them. And that's where we're starting to see you know, a lot of problems occur, uh, excessive spending beyond budgetary constraints, no controls. And it was just a matter of lack of communication that IT is a service initiative. And those two things really are fed, you know, by DevOps. DevOps is one of the feeds that help deliver this. Laurie, IT is a service, the future of DevOps. What, what do people really most need to know? Wow. Well, if it's going to be a service and if right. it's about automating processes, you really have to look at those processes. I mean, if you, you, if you automate a bad process, <laughs> what, what do you get? You get to fail faster. Yay! I mean, that's not really the goal anybody's supporting. Uh, you know, a lot of the efficiencies people associate with just being able to automate it. But if you're automating a process that I SSH into this server and then I edit this file and then I do these things and it's all automated, sure, you don't have to manually do it, but you really haven't saved that much time. You're still doing the same thing, you're just letting a computer do it for you. Uh, you know, there's a million different things around that whole, you know, thinking that automation is going to save all the time and make things go faster and make your life easier and free you up to innovate. You know, it's, it's true in the sense that it can do that, but only if you actually look at what you're doing. You have to look at the processes that you're automating and figure out, are these the right processes? Have we actually added additional layers of processes that were never necessary because we're so large that we've, you know, got this entire structure built out. So we have to have Bob and Mary and Jane look at this before we can put it out. Why did we do that? Well, because we did. Maybe that's inefficient. Get rid of it. Look at those processes and I think that's probably more of what's going to happen with DevOps and where it's more important and where real efficiencies are going to be gained and where business is actually going to gain a lot of competitive advantage through their processes just like they do on the business side is by being able to take a look at them again and streamline them like we did with the business and say wow we had all this stuff in here that wasn't necessary get rid of it and let's just focus on what we're supposed to be doing going back to the goals delivering this service and this application to the end user. As Lori and I both live on Lake Michigan the, anal the analogy she'll enjoy is you can automate driving the car into Lake Michigan. Yes. <laughs> I guess the, the moral of the story is you can't take humans out of automation, which then where are we with automation? So I guess automation needs to be monitored and supervised. Uh, Damon, the future of DevOps, uh, where are we going? What, what, what matters most? Um, well, that's, a big, that's a big loaded yeah, question. It, it is. Um, or or, or yeah. what's most important? 42. It's, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a great uh, number. Wasn't that the, the meaning of life, whatever? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, something. Anyways, um, I, I think first of all, I have to fundamentally realize this is not a technology problem. This is a business problem. Yeah. And you know, if if you if a business admits that there is no differentiation between the business and the technology that it runs on today, um, that you have to say that any business that cannot continue to com to compete, cannot continue to improve on time to market and quality, is going to lose. So I, I think it's it's fundamentally this is not a a, a technology problem. A technology problem. In any organization you go into that says hey, we have time to market and quality problems, and you know, the CIO or the CEO shakes your hand, says, great, go talk to those guys five floors down. They're, they're you know, team XYZ, and I knew, always knew they were screwed up. Go help them s sort their problems out. That company is going to lose, and I think that needs to be communicated more clearly and more firmly that all the things we're seeing, you know, like on the lean startup side and the um, big switch and you know, good to great and all these kind of uh, you know, big... Uh, all, the, all these uh, the business school thinking that's been driving you know that, that's really been been driving the um, uh, the business side of the world. This is the same thing. We just talk about it through technology flavors, and I think that needs to be fundamentally understood. So if you accept that, that if you don't 
continue to improve and you can't compete on time to market and quality that you're that you're going to lose as a business, then we can start talking, right? And then you, I think, have to kind of use sort of that, you know, the, the kind of to use the, the old, old gold rat expression. You know, if you make an improvement anywhere other than the constraint for your system, it's just an illusion. Right, so we can you know shuffle around and we can talk about our, our new you know our new automation tools or we can say we're doing this software development lifecycle or that, but we fundamentally don't restructure how we've drawn our organization, how we've aligned our, our people, how we incentivize them to um, to uh, to, uh, to to work. JP, you know, talked before about the qualities that you need to extend to IT. I think the guys at Netflix have this great um, thing about freedom and responsibility. That how do you empower teams to get done what needs to get done, yet also put the responsibility on them to make sure it gets done, right? Um, and often we see it in you know in kind of traditional corporate structures that's completely, completely lacking. We give them accountability means we yell at them if something goes wrong, but we don't give them the freedom and the responsibility and the empowerment to actually go do something about it, right? So there's all these broken things that happen that. That you know, for whether they were good or, or bad decisions in the past, I'm not really you know here to judge that. But for today, the management thinking um, and the organizational principles and the guiding um, um, instructions that we programmed our organization with are wrong. And I think that needs to be you know fundamentally addressed. And we're seeing it start with kind of the smaller webby startups because for them, they had to compete on that. And now we're seeing this infiltrate into the big banks. Because uh, what's a bank? It's smart people and, and computers, right? So you know they're not talking about it because they don't talk about anything. But um, you know when you go in and, and and work with them directly, you know they get it and they're driving in these in in, in, in these directions. So you know it, it's it's becoming it, it's a critical issue business issue that needs to be raised to to that level. Because once we start sorting things at that level, then we're going to be able to start talking about about the rest. I mean you know, we see this all the time that when you start to work at that level. Everything that falls out of that says, okay, how do we want our people to work? Let's put a, a straw man together. Let's, you know, use some of these open source tools that kind of have you know, these open source styles of working to see how this would work, and then let's turn around and take our current organization and do the delta. Say, what do we have to do pragmatically starting tomorrow to start to make ourselves look and feel more like that with that style of working, and how are we going to measure that? And really, we're going to care about cycle time. We're going to care about about scrap rate. We're going to care about lead times and you know mean time to repair, mean time to detect. New ways of looking at how, how of how we're working. So again, you know, I was kind of rambling there at the end. But if you go back to this is a business problem that has to be sorted out as a business problem. The technology solutions will just fall out of it. It'll basically become straightforward engineering, and we'll know what we're doing. If we try to attack this from the middle as a technology problem, we're just going to recreate our old problems, and we're just going to fail. So th that was my super short answer. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do want to do want to uh, address one point that you made, which I, I in a positive way. I like the way you applied using the new newer tool sets, the open source tool sets, as a way to get a feel for what yeah. you want to do for the model, right. Right. with the expectation that this may not be the end game that we implement. We may it gives us a feeling for how we want to act, and then we can go look at and see what we have around the company that we're already using to to implement it as a, in a production-like environment. So that I haven't really seen anybody pose it that way, and I think that's a great use for some of these newer tool environments. Well, yeah, I mean we're very pragmatic, and that's kind of our approach to moving big organizations. Is you have to, you know, it, it's not about giving them the tool or telling them what to do. You can't tell people what to do. You have to show them a way of seeing the problem. You have to show them a positive way of this is the way we want the future to look. To show them what it feels like, what this what this should feel like, right? Like show them how it could be, how, how great it could be. Just and get them, to see, yeah, get them to see, get them to see what, what that looks like. see it. What's that? Customer doesn't know what they want until we show them. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's really about, I mean, this year from the lean guys. It's about installing lean thinking. They don't say do it. This is the lean way. They say when you see your problems in a lean way and you see solutions in a lean way, then you're always going to be prepared because people, tools, technology, business conditions, everything changes always. So you're never going to have a complex organization. It's like you said your military example before, right? You want to, The point of basic training is not to tell you what to do. The point of basic training is to get everybody seeing things in the same way. So when you throw some curveball at them, you know that your you know 5,000 troops are going to react in a predictable and and and, and uh, mission correct way, right? So, yes. I don't know why. Andy, I, I want to give you a chance to, uh, Mr. Mann, I want to give you a chance to bring, bring us home. What do companies really need to be thinking about in terms of the DevOps? What's most important? Look, I think actually something that Damon just brought up, I think, is, is absolutely critical. It's about being realistic, being pragmatic, uh, especially for larger organizations. There are things that you can do, and there, honestly, there are going to be things that are just not going to work. 
And I, you know, sometimes I get a lot of stick online for, for being pragmatic and shooting down ideas. There's a place for idealism. Uh, there's a place for dogma. Um, it's not in a large enterprise. You need to figure out what's causing the roadblocks, what's slowing you down, what's causing quality problems, uh, what's, where are the structural issues that are you know, creating these impenetrable silos, and solve the problem. A lot of the big organizations I work with who are doing DevOps don't think they're doing DevOps. They think they're solving application quality issues. They think they're solving time to market issues. Uh, they're you know, getting operators and developers to work better together, but they sort of eschew this idea of we're doing DevOps because they're taking this pragmatic, no dogma approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's absolutely critical. You've got to understand what can your boss do, what can their boss do, what can you do within your department, what's in your control, what can you actually achieve within the next six months, 12 months. If you think you're going to get to continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous everything, in a three-week time frame, you're going to fail. In a large business, you don't get that many opportunities to fail that badly. Um, so find something that's going to work. And again, to Damon's point, prove that success, right? Do something that makes a difference, prove that it works, and then start to build on that success. A very pragmatic approach is absolutely critical, especially in those bigger enterprises. Yeah. And, you know, Real is better than perfect. I had a luncheon with a CIO. Uh, from a very from a large enterprise company uh, last week, and uh, surprisingly, one of the most well streamlined environments I've ever seen. I mean, doing DevOps without saying they're doing DevOps, and one of the most important things that he said was uh, that you know it's a matter of uh, understanding the uh, problem domain, you know, from the perspective of the business and being able to drive projects effectively. And, you know, they've become so adept at that that they've actually now, they're the PMO for all projects in the business. And I have never seen that come out of an IT organization before. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a statement on, uh, on preparation and understanding what it means to drive um, with a very pragmatic and very, uh, you know, Focused approach to solve to solving a, the business problem, being there for the business, and I and I, and I think some people get lost in that. They they their job is to come in and manage the Oracle database, and they forget that you know part of the reason why they're there in the first place is that data is a corporate asset, and today that corporate asset is becoming even more valuable with that business analytics and big data, and you know. You, you need to see yourself as bigger than just yeah. the DBA. So, so, you know, one thing just to support both what you guys you guys said is that um, this is, you know, that whole idea that if you go either way on, on the political spectrum, you come, you, come you, you end up at, you know, totalitarianism, right? It's like you go all the way to the left, all the way to the right, you end up in the same bad place. And it, it comes down to inside organizations, the idea that, hey, we're just being pragmatic and, which is sort of a code for we're going to accept the way the way things are to be dangerous, right? There's a little bit's good, it's bad, and and there's a dog Max is we got to do things the new flashy, um, you know, the new flashy, uh, 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 you know, cool kid way, right? They both meet up in the same place, which is it's bad for the organization, right? Yeah. So I think if you look at it from the point of view of of what are we here to do for the organization? We're here to solve time to market problems, and we're here to improve quality or reduce scrap rate, which is kind of an internal lean way of looking at looking at quality, right? So you know that pragmatism is fine as long as we're always taking steps to imp to improve those things. If we're taking steps that says, "Hey, we're, I'm being pragmatic," and you see a lot of times enterprise, that's code for I'm just going to let things be. I'm going I'm to take that thing that's bad, and I'm just going to say, "Oh no, really, it's good because I'm being pragmatic." When the reality is, it's actually hurting the thing that I'm that I'm trying to solve. It's hurting thing that I'm yeah. that I'm actually after. So yeah. I would caution that, you know, the pragmatism um, can be just as abused as the ivory tower or the purest of the sort of new, you know, cloudy, um, DevOpsy, you know, continuous delivery, cool kid way of doing things versus the old-fashioned ivory tower, you know, kind of I, I, uh, IT or architect way of doing things. Both those things are, I see, dramatic, be dramatically. Misused, but you can avoid all that if you just say, "What is the goal of the business? Time to market quality. What are all the steps we can, regardless of dogma? What are the steps we can do to, to go attack that goal in an incremental improvement way?" Everybody's everybody's happy. You know, one other piece of advice that CIO had that was really relevant to DevOps uh, to people watching this, thinking about wanting to do DevOps, is uh, they're not afraid to small to fail, but they fail small. 
and uh, and that's been a key driver for them being able to succeed and and take on some of these newer initiatives and, and drive to the cloud and move to SaaS very quickly and embrace new technologies is they, they're not afraid to fail, but they fail small. And I think with regard to what we're talking about here with DevOps, that is a great message. Don't be afraid to fail, but fail small. Well, and to figure that out, to go back, when you mentioned the PMO, right, the Project Management Office, usually that's very much associated with, with app development and whatnot, but they know how to manage I don't know, projects where you have little tasks in between. And if you go to them, you know, as operations and go, look, we have all these tasks, help us show the business why we need to do something different. Where can we get the most value or where's the least impact where we can try something so we're going to fail small but yet get a chance to try it. So leverage the people that already know how to do this in other parts of the organization and whom the business trusts to do that kind of planning. And, and get them maybe to help you, you know, make a model or, or make the case for, hey, let's try it with this, and, and here's, here's my chart that says this is a good idea, right. and, and you'll get better buy-in. Yeah. You, you, know, you know, Laurie, you know what, an interesting th trick I saw a, a PMO office actually do to make themselves relevant in this kind of service world is they rebranded themselves as the service management office, and instead of calling themselves, like, uh, product managers or PMOs or project managers, what they call it, they called themselves producers, and they literally looked at it like they're making a movie. Mm -hmm. And they, they call themselves they're, so they're executive producers, you know, blind producers, producers, and like they're that. and they're like, hey, we're part of this thing that never ends. So it's like the producing team is assigned to this project. So imagine a movie that never ends, and all they're there to do is make sure this movie gets shot, and the stars show up on time, and the you know the contents in the right place, and they got the right permits and everything. So they they looked at it in that way to say that you know there's no more notion of a project in our organization anymore because. Um, our customers don't look at it as a project. Right? Our customers see a running service, and that thing it has a start, and it never has an end until we turn it off. So what are we doing You know, calling in a project? Now, the interesting about that is they ran then into the, into the CFO because the CFO managed all their budgets hmm. in terms of you know, capital expense, which is a project. So now, they, you know, now like, oh, geez, we got to rethink how we do our resource. So it, it forced a lot of issues, but that was a great example of um, an interesting, you know, I could call it a, a like culture it. hack that yeah. I saw an enterprise uh, PMO team do that suddenly forced the issue throughout the organization. Because otherwise, you said, "Oh yeah, we're a service or you know delivery organization." Oh sure, sure. But they ran themselves like an old-fashioned you know uh, classic software delivery firm with an ops team sort of hanging off the uh, hanging off the back end for dear life. So you know it, it, it's it, you know that just I just that just came to mind when you brought up how you know go to the, use the resources you got. And if you get them on board, they'll come up with their own kind of smart ways to to uh, to force the issue. You know, you talked about movies that never end, but uh, I think it's probably time looking at the clock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this particular movie probably has to end, but it's been a great movie. Uh, yeah. I, I appreciate the expertise of, of the four of you. Great conversation. Thank you. And uh, I will uh, send you a link. We can all tweet about it happily. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank yeah, you. You got it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right.